Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network, Rob Ellis, Derek Gunn. Appreciate you hanging out with us. Uh, haven't talked to our next guest in a while. Looking forward to getting his review of what went down yesterday. Does an awesome job uh, covering the Eagles and the NFL, along with his compadre, Zach Berman. And they have an excellent podcast as well, Birds with Friends. You can follow him on Twitter, at Bo underscore Wolf. And he is definitely a straight shooter with upper management written all over him. What's happening, Bo? How are you, man? How are we doing, guys? Happy Good, camp. man. Good to see you, bro. Yeah, Good, you. Good. Good man. Uh, happy to be. Happy to have it back. Happy to have some uh, some actual stuff to talk about rather than digging in the lists and all that fun stuff that we do to get through the last couple of months. Rob's, Rob's a little overzealous about this camp stuff, dude. I'm just telling. Can you. I enjoy? You know can, what? Can you know, I... We had one day. We got a day off, and I'm telling you what, I'm loving this day off. Yeah, you're. I know you're tired. You didn't. You, you know, Bo had a tough day <laughs> in, in that sun yesterday. It was hot. It was hot. We know that, Bo. Did you get your readers when you were out there, Bo? No readers yesterday. Didn't I didn't go for the readers yesterday. Wow. You know what I usually do yeah. is I, I usually save my one readers for like the last practice of camp. That's my move. Okay. All right. It gets an anticipation thing. You know, it yeah. makes it that much better at the end. <laughs> gotcha. What's your go-to? I I'm I'm a I, I know you don't get the gelati option there, but I, I like the cherry gelati. Oh, I okay. Have I haven't done that. I, I like the mango. Yeah. Uh, mango can't hurt you. And the lime, I guess. The yeah, lemon I'm a lime. Big, yeah, I'm a big lime. Classic, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, go-tos. All right, so give me something, Bo, on a positive note that stood out, something you said, okay, uh, so-and-so looked good. This was kind of crisp. I get what it is. It was an hour practice in the, in the first one, but give me something that, that caught your eye at least. This guy looked bigger than I thought, whatever. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it, you said it. It's like uh, the first practice, it was a pretty sloppy practice, which you would expect, and you know, they weren't. They didn't have pads on. There, there was not a ton going on. But I think if I, would, if I was to look for like some sign of encouragement, um, you know, I thought, you know, I thought like Reed Blankenship looked pretty good at safety for one day. Uh, he made, he made a nice, uh, diving play. You know, James Bradbury looked great. Um, but that's sort of what you would expect. He was great last summer too. Um, the defense was certainly ahead of the offense yesterday, but, uh, it's the beginning of camp when the defense is always ahead. Plus they were just working in the red zone. So the windows are tighter. It's harder to score. So, um, I, I would, I would caution from getting like, you know, two over our skis, uh, from, from what happened yesterday. Well, you know, I, I still can't come to grips with under this new collective bargaining agreement, how limited the practice sessions are, you know, and, and I understand it worked extremely well for the Eagles last year, man. But do you get a sense like just when you're starting to get into it, it's it's over. It's like, what do we see here? <laughs> yes, the practices are definitely short. And like you said, it's it's like we thought they were short last year and they were extremely healthy and everything worked out well. So. We can't really complain this time around, yeah. um, but it is like, you know, having, you know, having been in those two days in Lehigh, it is a little yeah. bit jarring that like, this is, this is all they do that we get to see. Mm. Anything, Bo, any alignments, anybody playing with anybody else that, and I know like they have their, their, the depth chart is very loose right now. Cause things are, everybody's working on things. Certain, some guys, I know Hassan Reddick wasn't, wasn't able to practice, et cetera. Anything you saw that you thought, okay, that's kind of interesting. So-and-so with so-and-so or anything like that. Yeah, I think the one thing that was interesting to me, depth chart wise, was that they were rotating Christian Ellis um, as the second linebacker with Nick Kobe Dean. Mm -hmm. uh, he was rotating with Nicholas Morrow, mm -hmm. um, and I only I, I only thought that was interesting because it was a little bit different than the, what they did at other places, right? So mm -hmm. at safety, you know, Sidney Brown is starting at the bottom. He's he's on the third team with every other rookie. You know, Jalen Carter's first snaps came with the third team. So if he's going to rise up and take. Reed Blankenship or Terrell Edmonds' job, he's going to have to do it slowly but surely, right? right. Cam Jurgens got the first shot at right guard. We will see if, you know, Tyler Steen gets first team reps moving forward. I'm, I'm not so sure that he will, um, or if, you know, Jack Driscoll is involved there. But for yesterday, it was, you know, it was just Cam Jurgens. Um, running back, it's going to be a rotation all camp long, right? We saw like five different guys take snaps with the ones yesterday. But at linebacker, um, you know, the expectation is that it would be Nicobe Dean and Nicholas Morrow, but Christian Ellis had this great spring, um, you know, six practices, but but he looked pretty sharp. And then, you know, he made it. He had another interception yesterday against Marcus Mariota. It was much more of a like just a really bad throw by Marcus Mariota than a, a uh, like sparkling play from Christian Ellis. But I thought it was interesting just to see that on day one they're already rotating those guys. Um, so it, it tells you that that Ellis's stock has risen a little bit this offseason. What, what did I tell you, Rob? I've told you, Christian Ellis, because he's six three two forty compared to Morrow being six one two fifteen. 
there's something to be said for having that, that girth in terms of holding down the edge when it comes to hey, Derek. Right. Ellis has always rise to the top, my friend. Yeah. Okay. What? Even what? guys who spell their last name incorrectly with what? Yeah, how do you feel about the Ellis, the, the double S, Rob? Yeah, I have to talk to him. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to maybe get that straightened out. Yeah. Because this is how I feel about B E A U's. Yes. Um, U L now- F. Either way. Yeah, well, I don't mind. I, it's, it's weird. I have like a. I kind of like other wolves, even if it's O L F or like O L F E. Are all part of the same group? But a B E A U versus yeah. a bow. This is like we are. We are enemies. Yeah, that's throwdown. I, I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna approach Christian and see if he'll lose the last S. Yeah, it, we'll, it's we'll like see how it goes. It's like people who have trashed the traditional spelling of Derek D E R E K D E R E C. I mean, True. seriously, you know, yeah. there's only one way to properly spell the name Derek. And then people have abused it through the years. But anyway, exactly. um, but this is they, critical stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. This is, this is better than football stuff. Exactly. Right? I, I agree. agree. I agree. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Bo, take me back to the running back scenario, because I think that's one of the more fascinating entities about this team when you consider who they've added to the roster. And I've said, I expect the, t- the Eagles running game to be one of the top three or four in the league still, but I don't think they're going to have a thousand yard rusher. Who do you think the lead back is for this team? I think you sort of described it well um, because like they have the superpower that other teams don't. And that's Jalen hurts. Right. So um, you get, you have what Jalen hurts brings as a runner to the running game. And then you have what Jalen hurts brings to everybody else because of the attention that he sucks in from opposing defenses. And that opens things up for uh, opposing running for, for his, his running back teammates. And you also have one of the best offensive lines in the league. Right. So Mm -hmm. I like to call it, you know, the most running back friendly offense in the league. And I kind of like what they've done building yeah. this group out because they don't they don't need a bell cow um no. you know if you look at uh sort of like the the metrics of like per carry uh success over the past two years like rashad penny is like the best running back in the league but he can't stay healthy he, you know he, he and the eagles aren't going to rely on him to stay healthy but that's a nice upside you know dart throw to throw you've got kenny gainwell who i think is a little bit different than what we thought he was coming in he's not this like explosive uh big play guy he is super reliable. Um, if you look over the past two years, no running back in the NFL uh, gets positive yardage on a higher percentage of his carries than Kenny Gainwell. He's the only guy over 90%. Um, so he is like very reliable and he has stayed healthy. So he's a good, like if, if everything else breaks down, we've got Kenny Gainwell, that's fine. You've got DeAndre Swift who has that big playability and I think is not really built to be a bell cow, but we saw it yesterday at practice. You know, the Eagles like threw four passes to him in a row. Mm. Um, I think his role here is to be, um, you know, their their receiving threat out of the backfield. Last year, this offense threw the ball to running backs less often than any other offense in the entire NFL. And when they did throw the ball to running backs, they were the second worst offense in terms of the production out of those plays. So uh, that is a, an area in which they can definitely improve. So I think all of those things are interesting. And then, you know, you've got Boston Scott and Trey Sermon, who are also guys who, who have a little bit of upside, too. So uh, given like how how friendly the offense is for running backs, I think going with like volume at the position is probably a smart thing to do. Yep. Bo, I feel like I ask all of our guests this, but I, but I, I am curious since we're on it. We haven't really with Nick Sirianni seen much of a st- screen game. Do you think we'll see any more of that or it will just be? you know, dump offs or, or wheel routes or that kind of thing. Like, will that be incorporated at all in your estimation? Yeah, I think more than last year, but it's hard to say just how much. I mean, you know, some of the, the plays yesterday were, were screens to DeAndre Swift. And I think if you look at the Colts offense when he was there, you know, they did that plenty with Naheem Hines. So somewhere in, you know, Nick Sirianni's playbook, he has these plays. I, I do think that, you know, when it gets down to, you know, uh, we're it, it's it's a one score game, it's the third quarter. Like, are we going to call a screen or are we going to try to throw the ball to A.J. Brown or Devontae right. Smith or Dallas Goddard? I think that stuff weighs out eventually. But I do think that that's a, um, a tool that they probably need to use a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Well, um, fill me in on the Nolan Smith hype. Yesterday, people were raving about him coming off the edge and, you know, how quick he is and things like that. Um, he dropped in a draft. Could he be better than, than we even anticipate? I mean, I know it's still early in training camp. It's a controlled environment. But from your perspective, could he be even better than we even anticipate? So, you know, I'm definitely being a little bit patient you know, yep. for, for day one because there are certain types of players where, like, you know, when it's, when it's shorts and shells, you know, the pads are not on, there's no contact, these players should look good, right? Yeah. Like, 
you know, a, a, a scat back running back should, should look really fast. Mm-hmm. Nolan Smith, whose game is, is speed and is a little bit undersized for the position. He should look really good yesterday. Yeah. So he checked that box. That's nice, but that doesn't necessarily mean much, but uh, I'm curious to see, first of all, how, you know, how good he looks when the pads do come on. And, and I think he's an interesting, and I think he's probably the, the most interesting test of how creative Sean Desai is going to be. Because if you like, you know, if you look at the structure of the defense, the easiest thing to do would be just, he's, he spells Hassan Reddick, right? You know, Hassan Reddick's on the field 75% of the time. And when he's not on the field, it's Nolan Smith and they're playing the same role. But if, you know, if Sean Desai can get creative and get them both on the field, at the same time, and then all of a sudden, you know, the opposing offense doesn't know which one is coming, which one is dropping. Uh, maybe Hassan Reddick is is playing a little bit more as like a, a, a true d- defensive end, and Nolan Smith gets to be in space a little bit more. Um, I think it's gonna it's gonna tell us a little bit about Sean Desai how he uses Nolan Smith. But I mean, in terms of uh, his personality and uh, everything you hear about the guy, it seems like he is mm-hmm. he is wired the right way. Um, you know, I, I, every time every time I get the notification on my phone that Brandon Graham is going live with his, uh, his Instagram videos for <laughs> the, the, uh, the rookies singing, you know, happened yesterday and it's supposed to be Jalen Carter. He's going up, I guess like the song wasn't working. The, the track wasn't working. So, so Nolan Smith just comes up saves his buddy and he's singing acapella. It's like, this is, he's a, he's a, he's a dynamic personality. So um, yeah. I think, I think Eagles fans will probably come to like him, but we'll see exactly how productive mm. he'll be. I, yeah, I noticed him uh, in the Eagles unscripted that they do on YouTube, which Derek and I were talking about a little earlier. is very well yeah. done. He's breaking things down. He's he's mugging it up, and I don't mean in a bad way, but he's he's a fun loving guy. But you also see he's got that that swagger, that sort of it. You know, it, again, he's got to be able to play. And there's the a, other I mean, yeah. you know, I, I haven't I haven't sat down and had a long conversation with him, but just from from watching this stuff too, there seems like a, an earnestness to that personality right it's not yeah. just for show it's not just for cameras like that's who he right. really is no question all right you brought up uh Jalen carter and saying you know look he's he had to work his way he's gonna have to work his way up do you anticipate by the time the season starts when it gets real uh that he is a starter that he is getting the bulk of the minutes there at that spot he and fletch how do you how do you see that happening yeah i don't know exactly how it's going to play out i think there are there are certainly enough snaps to go around um you know i think milton williams is going to be very involved too and then I was actually a little bit curious to see and, and interested that, you know, when they opened up in an even man front for the first time yesterday, it was Jordan Davis next to Fletcher Cox. And so he was not playing just the nose. Maybe his role is expanding a little bit. But, um, you know, the thing about defensive tackles is, and, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before, like relative to other positions, it takes a while um, and it takes long. It's like defensive tackle and tight end are positions where you sort of have to wait till year two or year three. And uh, tight end is becoming a little bit less like that, but defensive tackle remains that way. Like the, the best players in the league, aside from Aaron Donald, you know, your Quinn and Williams is Dexter Lawrence. These guys, all of these guys, their numbers did not shoot up until like year three or year four. So right. if Jordan Davis or, or Jalen Carter is going to be great, we may not know right away. Um, that said, you know, you lost a lot of production from Javon Hargrave, right? And so you have to replace it somehow. And so the, the Eagles need Jalen Carter to be pretty good right away and so i'm curious to see how the snap count is gonna you know is gonna go fletcher cox is getting up there he can't play you know 75 percent of the snaps mm-hmm. anymore so carter's gonna have to play milton williams is gonna have to play jordan davis is gonna have to play and then even after that like you know uh, Kentavia street or uh, marlon tui pelotu those guys are gonna need to be involved as well Bo, how would you categorize what nick sirianni said about cam jurgens he's our starting right guard for now I'm really interested about this because, you know, they've done we've, – we've had two camps under Nick Sirianni and we've had yep. two different offensive line, quote-unquote, competitions, right? Two years ago, it was Jordan Mailata against Andre Dillard, and every single day they were switching back and forth. One guy got the day with the ones, one guy got the days with the twos, and then Dillard got hurt, Mailata ran away with the job, and, and the rest was history. Last year, we thought that, like, you know, Isaac Sayamala was going to have to battle Jack Driscoll for, for that right guard job, and – it was Sayamala day one, and he was installed, and, and that was it, and that was history. I don't think that it's necessarily going to be uh, a rotation with these guys. I kind of think it's uh, it's not Cam's job, but if it, it's his job to lose, right? And so if he struggles, then we're going to see some other guys get a shot. Or if you know if Tyler Steen is playing out of his mind in the in Jeff Stoutland's eyes, then then he'll get a shot mm-hmm. too. But I, I think that it is like 
I think the Eagles would like for Cam Jurgens to just go out and steadily win the job and they don't have to worry about competition. But uh, it's interesting because they're, they are certainly two different body types. You know, Cam Jurgens is a center by trade. He's a little bit undersized. Tyler Steen is a much more, uh, you know, Brandon Brooks build for the position. And I think there are, there are some ways in which that helps Jason Kelsey. Um, and then maybe there are some ways in which Jeff Stoutland can envision getting both Jurgens and Kelsey out in the open field. And that's an interesting thing for him. So mm. I'm curious to see how it goes. I think my, my guess right now is that, you know, it's, it's, I would say it's like 80% Jurgens job. Okay. Bo, what are you thinking uh, in terms of what they want to see Jalen Hurts improve upon? Uh, we all know he had an incredible year, right? There's no doubt. But what it, what does he need to do to take it to the next level, take it to a higher level than he took it to last year? That's a good question. And, you know, I don't know what Nick Sirianni's answer for that is. Like, my answer is stay on the field. Yeah. Um, 17 games. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And every time we ask Nick about this or Jalen about this, like, you know, you just signed the big contract. Are you are you going to be a little bit more cautious about carrying the ball, running the ball so much? And you know, Jalen said the thing yesterday. I'm I'm embracing you know my uniqueness at the position, right? So he's not going to shy away from what makes him special, and that's great. Mm. And that's how he should feel, right? It's it's the coaching staff's job to protect him, right? Yep. And it was interesting yesterday, day one of camp. What's the the first thing we see? is like we saw like four quarterback running plays, right, with both him and Marcus Mariota. Like there's an easy – you know, they're on the four-yard line. It's a quarterback draw. Nobody touches him. It's an easy touchdown. That's that's great. And you don't want to take away what makes him and the offense special. But, you know, from my vantage point, you know, it's it's week three. It's the third quarter. Like, do we need a called run here yeah. for Jalen Hurts? And no. You're, and you're up, you're up 17 points? Probably not, yeah. Right. Um, and so, you know, I would like to see a little bit – less of that especially as part of a designed running game right you're not going to stop him from doing what's natural to him when he's rolling out of the pocket and he you know he has room to escape um in terms of everything else like you know he's done a pretty good job of limiting turnovers i think they'd like to, to keep that up you know he, he does take a, a fair amount of sacks that's something that they could potentially mm-hmm. uh work with him on but you know last year was like you know throw the ball over the middle a little bit more mm-hmm. and that was easy uh you know and aj brown helped a lot with that um you know his his uh, his downfield passing was really good last year, right? There's not a lot of little areas like that. I would imagine that the things that they're really worried about are are more to do with, you know, we heard so much last summer about how this was the first time in like seven seasons for Jalen Hurts that he got to play with the uh, play caller for the second year in a row, right? Well, now all of a sudden he's got a, a new play caller right. and, you know, he's got a great relationship with Brian Johnson. Those guys know each other very well, but I would imagine that the, the bigger focus is making sure that like, he is, um, you know, understanding this offense and seeing things from the, the vantage point of this offense without really, you know, second thoughts. Oh, how do you see this third receiver spot playing itself out? Quez, Quez Watkins, I think, picked the wrong city to make that Twitter statement he made earlier this year about, you know, bleep everybody who doubts me. And then they bring in the kids that he is from the Falcons. How do you see it what, uh, is shaping up? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I think when they signed Zacchaeus, I, I, I didn't think that um, they had done enough at the position. And I was a little bit surprised that they didn't do more at the position. Um, and it's a little bit like the running back conversation, in, in throwing to the running backs, where, um, you know, Quez Watkins, in terms of the routes that he ran, was targeted, like, less often than almost every receiver in the league, right? Because they, they everything flows through A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Dallas Goddard. But still, I think you need more out of that position. And, you know, you could you I, I'm willing to listen to the argument that like Quez's speed changes things and opens up space. Mm-hmm. And like there's a there's a it's part of the reason that, you know, Dallas Goddard gets so many yards after the catch because Quez is clearing the open field a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he needs to he needs to make more use of the targets that he does get. I mean, we all remember the, the drop in the Super Bowl and then they yeah. only end up with three points there. And that's part of the reason they lose the game. Um, I think Zacchaeus is interesting. One thing that I'm I'm a little bit surprised by, and this is easier said than done. It's not like, you know, mm-hmm. if you could find a starting caliber outside receiver, everybody would want him. But, you know, one of the things that was sort of a secret weapon for the offense last year was putting Devontae Smith in the slot. He was like, when he was in the slot, he was like the second best receiver in the league uh, mm-hmm. after Justin Jefferson. He was mm-hmm. like super productive. And I thought that they would maybe, you know, lean into that a little bit more this year. 
And instead, they go out and get Zacchaeus, who's a slot receiver by trade. And they didn't add necessarily anybody else on the outside. Um, now, Quez could potentially do that. But um, I'm just I, I'm curious to see what happens. I think I think Quez is probably um, like the speed that he brings maybe matters more to the shape of things on offense. But but I'm willing to listen to the, the possibility that that Zacchaeus is just a better player. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you the same question. Um about the special teams have they given michael clay enough i I know that's not always the primary and you got to kind of figure it out and i'm I'm excluding jake elliott obviously but have they given him that over the last two years has there been enough there and is this more of an indictment of him or a lack of talent that the special teams hasn't been great yeah i was surprised when i looked i looked at this last year um because the you know the special teams got significantly better as the season went on and um i i looked at every other like team in the league that they're like top 10 players and snaps on special teams. And I was really, I mean, I, I thought that the Eagles special teams were young and I was surprised to learn that they were by far the youngest special teams unit in the league. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? There are no uh, Chris Maragoses or Brian Brayman's on this team, right? These like, you know, veteran special teamers who are here just to do that. Pretty much all of the core special teamers are guys, mm-hmm on their rookie contracts, the Kobe Dean, those guys, right. you know, yeah. guys who are, you know, you hope are going to grow into you know, players on offense or defense at some point, but um, are, are rookie or second year or third year players. Like, you know, Patrick Johnson was like the, uh, is like one of the more veteran yeah. uh, guys and he's in his third year. Right. Right. Um, so I, I think that has a lot to do with what, how the special teams performs um, at the same time it's hard for me to argue that that's like not how they should do it. Um, Because if you are balancing where to allocate your resources, if you can get, you know, like the 20th best special teams while only playing rookies, that's probably good enough. If it means that you can, you know, infuse talent into the offense and on the defensive line. Um, Like if the difference between being able to sign Hassan Reddick or signing like a a worse edge rusher is going light at special teams, that's probably worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do, I don't, I don't think that it is like, um, Michael Clay has done a bad job with the special teams. I think he's, I think he's done pretty well with what he's been given. Mm-hmm. Um, we will see like, uh, you know, w- I guess we'll, we'll follow what happens with the punters. Um, so don't bring up punter. Don't bring up the punter. I'm no, the, the, the S word. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is it a real, is it a real like, competition, Bo, in, in your estimation? Well, I think it's a real competition. I don't think that that they would waste a roster spot on uh, Zentner if it wasn't a real competition. But uh, you know, one day in, Sipos would look looked better. I would say. You know, um, when I look at the special teams play, we see a lot of teams across the league do this, and it's very risky. A lot of them will play veteran players. You know, the short and, and you know, and I'm, I'm playing off of what you said about they like to utilize more of the younger players to fill out those. Sure, and you know, Malcolm Jenkins used to play exactly as a, as a course, during Andy yeah. Reid's during Andy Reid's tenure all of his veteran players play special teams and that's why their special teams were so good. And I, and, and as risky as it sounds, if, if Michael Clay wants to secure his status with this team, especially if it continues to be as mediocre as it was last year, he may have to give some, 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 some leeway to putting in his primetime players at key special team spots. Wouldn't you think? Well, you know, my understanding is that would not be up to him, right? Like that's that's more of a Nick Sirianni conversation or a okay. Howie Roseman conversation. I'm sure that Michael Clay, you know, I'm sure he would have loved to have TJ Edwards as a core special teamer last year. Yeah. And I think there's a reason that he wasn't. And it wasn't because Michael Clay didn't want him. It was because the team didn't want to waste him there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, look, I, it's there is certainly a risk reward. Uh, that's for sure when it comes to that. Bo, quickly, and we'll let you get out of here. And we appreciate you giving us a couple minutes. Um, how do you view the NFC East? Um, are you a believer that the Giants are are on the climb or did they just kind of sneak up on people a little bit last year? As far as Dallas goes, some changes in terms of Mike McCarthy taking over the play calling, Kellen Moore out, Schottenheimer in. And then Washington, you know, obviously the big story there is Eric B. Enemy and not to mention the ownership. But how do you see the NFC East? Uh, not well. Um, really? Mm. Yeah. Now, I, Dallas scares me a little bit. Um, because I think they're still the most talented team and they've got, you know, the next best quarterback in the division. Mm -hmm. Um, But like getting rid of Kellen Moore and bringing in Brian Schottenheimer and like giving the keys to Mike McCarthy just feels unserious to me and not something that's going to be designed to last. So I don't necessarily trust that. I mean, I I think adding Brandon Cooks is a big deal to that offense. Mm -hmm. And I think their defense can be really, really good, you know, 
there's nothing that Mike McCarthy can do to make Micah Parsons not awesome. So they would be the ones who scare me still the most. I think the Giants are in for a dose of reality. Um, I think they're a little bit, you know, too happy about a season that was like taking advantage of an easy schedule. They were not that good of a team. You know, they got their doors blown off against the Eagles when it mattered. They gave, they go out and give Daniel Jones $40 million. Like again, feels a little bit unserious to me. Um, I I think they're in for uh, a regression and then Washington, you know, they're just biding time until until the owner can make his his real changes and hire a coach next off season, right? Like, right. you know, Sam, we're gonna we're gonna pretend like Sam Howell is ready to to take over. Their defense could be interesting, but um, you know, I think the Eagles are due to regress in a lot of ways. But I think if you look at the division, they should be feeling pretty good. Mm. Okay, all right. Well, right, listen, uh, yeah, appreciate you uh, you hopping on and uh, keep up the good work at the Athletic. And again, you you could follow Bo at Bo underscore Wolf, and you can follow him uh, at The Athletic PHI. And also tell folks about the podcast with your, yourself and, uh, and Zach. Yeah, Birds with Friends, uh, wherever you follow podcasts. You can watch us on YouTube as well. With Zach, we are live uh, yeah. every day. There's a practice, uh, usually at around, on around 3.30. So, so you'll be back at it tomorrow. Love okay. it. Love it. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Bo, thanks, man. I'll, always appreciate, appreciate you your time. Thank you very thanks, much. guys. All right, All right take, take care, care. bud. That is Bo Wolf from – the athletic. All right, Gunner, good stuff there. I have it. Have the answer on the NFC East. Yeah, he is not yeah. bullish. Uh, bullish on anybody other than really the Eagles. It sounds like he's the first one that basically said that. You yeah. know, um, which is a little surprising, but I like that perspective. You know, it gives you both perspectives, and you know, you can't argue against his perspectives because when you look at the other three, the other three teams, huge question marks. The the, the Eagles are the only team in the division you don't have a multitude of question marks. The other th- three teams are like a daytime soap opera. You know, there's so many moving parts and so many question marks. You know, can can Brian Dabo do it again with Daniel Jones, what he did last year with a much tougher schedule? And, and a weird thing, and we'll talk to Jordan Raynana too, but it, yeah. the, the Saquon stuff is strange, it's man. It's weird, you know, yeah. Weird. yeah. Weird. You know, and they've been doling out a lot of money with the Giants. I can't wait to talk to Jordan about this. But Saquon did get the big money like some of the other players on that team have gotten. Mike McCarthy calling plays, you know, new OC down in Dallas. What does Brandon Cooks add to this offense? Are they going to stress the field more? What is that offense going to look like without Ezekiel Elliott pounding it between the tackles? And then who is Sam Howell? You know, right. is the right. enemy the right guy to change the complexion of that offense with a no-name quarterback? Yeah. You know, it, it's a, it's so many great – that's why that's why I said yesterday, Rob, mm-hmm. not just the division but across the league, there's so many incredible storylines this year yeah. like I've never seen before. You know, now that Justin Herbert's got that big money, there's more pressure on him than ever. Sure. Sean Payton is basically saying, it's my way or the highway in Denver. We're going to get into that in the football segment. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, Lamar Jackson got his money. Can he stay healthy? You know, Aaron Rodgers with the Jets. You know, can Kansas City come close to repeating as champion something that hasn't been done in like 15 years? Yeah. I mean, it's – man, the storylines are incredible across the board. Now, I'm – I'm see, I'm excited about the season, Rob. Well, I'm looking past all this training camp stuff, man. Oh, uh, listen, I hear you. Uh, but here, here's the thing for me. I want to go back to Dallas for one minute. Yeah. It has a very Sixers feel to it. Here's what I mean. True. They're almost always good in the regular season. There's always drama. Yep. There are superstars. But you feel like in the end, when it's really nut-cutting time, so to speak, Yep. that they come up small. And I don't know that Mike McCarthy taking over play calling solves that. It, you know, in fact, I think it, it it may even set you back further. And and I don't know that Dak is equipped in those situations either. That That's the thing about Dallas. Like, are they going to be tough? Have they played the Eagles very well? Yeah, no doubt. All those kind of things. But when they get to the postseason, it just feels like something comes over them and they're not yeah. the same team. Yes. I couldn't agree more. They're like, they're like the LA Chargers. Yeah. So to speak. You know, you have yeah. the talent to do great things and you always fall short of your destination. I do think the addition of Brandon Cooks and Stefan Gilmore are going to be tremendous for that team. Right. You know, um, and let's face it, Dallas always gives the Eagles fits. Dak Prescott gives the Eagles fits. Mm-hmm. They both have tough schedules. Who who can stay the healthiest? You know, um, I, I, I can't wait to see it, Rob. But you're right. Jerry Jones... Jerry Jones, the house of Jerry Jones always finds a way to crumble mm-hmm. when it counts the most. Yep. Hey, uh, Buda Baker has received a raise. 
prior to camp. He's getting 2.4 million in bonuses and incentives this year, including a 300 grand signing bonus. He'll also receive a raise for next season. So he ain't going um, anywhere. No, they did some tweaks there to 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 make him happy. And the last thing they need is any more turnover on that yes. team. Let's face it. So yep. they, they keep a good one. Uh, so he's gonna he's he'll be happy. So there you go. But we'll pass along anything we get uh, throughout the course of the show. Uh, that's for sure. So again, two o'clock, Jordan Ray nine one thirty. Derek, we'll do our NFL segment that we usually do at two. Yeah. Uh, the team that we will do today uh, is the Ravens. Yes. And I will say this in in doing our you know, the Raven research, they have some ridiculously good players for a team that hasn't been around. You know all that long it's i i will add this outside of a few key players yeah if you look at the players that we 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 um looked at in terms of the best players some of the best players in history of the organization they weren't players that stayed there nine ten twelve years mm -hmm. they were there like three four years gone and then the next way three four years gone yeah and it's not like you know like some of these other teams you know these players were there nine ten twelve years played their entire now they've had a few you know, like obviously a Ray Lewis that stayed there for the duration of their careers, but a lot of them weren't like that. Right. Right. Rod Woodson's an example of, you exactly. know, who bounced around. It's funny. You could put Rod Woodson on like maybe three different teams three, three, oh my goodness. <laughs> for what we're doing here. You know, obviously Pittsburgh and the Ravens, you know, maybe the Raiders or whatever, but yeah. So that's uh well, all right. So we'll get, that'll be our team that we, uh, we dive into today, but there's a lot of NFL news and I'm telling you, the stuff that Sean Payton said uh, regarding last year with Denver is uh, flammable, to say the least. So we'll get into that. Oh, um, nice, nice, uh, nice comeback from by Robert Sala. Uh, just came down. He took the high road. So I'll give him credit okay. for that. So okay. Robert Sala had a response to uh, Sean Payton's comment. Okay. All right. So we'll do all that when we get back, uh, including uh, some Phillies as they win last night as well. He's Derek Gunn. I'm Rob Ellis. We're Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. All right. I want to tell you about Jim Murray and Principal Financial Group because knowing who to trust, knowing you have somebody that you can trust, that you can put your faith in, who will help you to, you know, when it comes to your money, you work hard enough, you know, you, you want to be able to be taken care of later in life. And Jim Murray and Principal Financial Group are the people that you should entrust. All right. Whether it's retirement planning, 401k review, insurance review, you might have a small business and you need help with your employee benefits. That's another resource that Jim can assist you with. I know personally, I've entrusted my IRA, my 401k rollover with Jim. I couldn't be any happier. You will be too. Give him a call. 610. 996-4751. 610-996-4751. You can also email him as well. Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y dot Jim at principal.com. That's Murray dot Jim at principal.com.